Welcome to Popcorn Talk, featuring movie discussions, news, and interviews, presenting the film scene with Ileana Douglas. Ileana is an actress, writer, author, and film historian with a need to discuss movies that borders on obsession. You'll learn the history of movies one great story at a time. The film scene is the deep cuts of movie podcasts, featuring movies we love by the people who made them. And now, Ileana Douglas. Yes, hello. Hi, it's Ileana Douglas. I'm here with Jeff Graham, and this is The Film Scene. And we are live today with Daniel Waters, which I can't wait for. Such a fan. Heather's is, I would consider, an important movie in terms of my taste, especially in dark comedy. Yeah. Talk about a classic. Yeah, so I remember, too, that that came out in my career when I was sort of just starting movies, too. Oh, yeah. So it would be the kind of movie you'd really want to be in. You didn't audition for it, did you? No, I okay. was still. I would have still been in New York then. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, Winona Ryder. You know, coming off of Beetlejuice and then Heather's. Yeah. Christian Slater, in his Jack Nicholson impression. I gotta ask. I'm gonna ask Daniel about that. That's gonna be my fan question. Definitely. Um, okay, let's get to what is uh, going on. One thing I want to uh, promote, which I'm very excited about, leaving um, later today for. Tucson, Arizona, for the uh, Loft Cinema Film Festival. Allison Andrews and I are going to be there, and I'm getting a going to get a reward. I'm so excited, and we're going to be screening the movie. Thank you yes, for our the studio, applause. Yes, a studio audience. <laughs> <laughs> so Sunday, the Loft Cinema Sunday at uh, two p.m. We're going to be screening Grace of My Heart. There's going to be a Q and A, and uh, you have uh, my book is going to be there. I'll be doing a book signing, and they're going to have the book there if people want to purchase it. So I look forward to meeting people, and of course, most importantly, they part of my going. They agreed to drive me to the OK Corral. Oh, that's that, of course. So I'm really excited about that. I oh, love great. road trips. Oh yeah, and to get to see any iconic, I feel like you can't travel to a city if there's an iconic film thing and not go see it, right? No, I can't. I, I always look. I go, what's what's nearby that I can go see? It's oh, perfect. and there it is, the Law Film Fest. What exactly is the award? Uh, it's a like, achievement, lifetime achievement, although I haven't really achieved enough, but <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> I feel like once you get enough lifetime achievement awards, then you know. Yes. You get the achievement award for the number of lifetime achievement awards you've yes. gotten. Oh, look at this. See, isn't this great? Yeah, I, can't I love wait. it. Yeah, I can't wait to go there. It's These perfect. independent cinemas that have cropped up all, all over the country are so fantastic. They have, you know, their own programming and I'm getting to know the staff there. Uh, the first movie I'm actually seeing is going to be Point Blank. Perfect. That, you know, so that'll be on Friday and all sorts of people are going to be there and um, I, I can't wait. So that's going to be fun. I've never been to Tucson, Arizona. All right, let's get to the James Dean crazy controversy. It's, it's so horrifying i know tw twitter can be fun sometimes but then it's when s so many weird things cinematic things you go oh, okay i have to i can't comment on all of these. Oh, it's, it's a whirlwind but if any of our listeners haven't heard yes what's going on is that there's a vietnam war movie coming out next year right and they have cast james dean to play one of the supporting roles and the way that James Dean is going to be in this movie, because, of course, both of us know that James Dean has been deceased for a number of decades, yeah. is they're going to have an actor voicing the likeness of James Dean, and they're going to recreate James Dean via CGI. Yeah, it, which is, uh, I, I, I don't know, I'm just, I'm against it. As, a, as an actress, I would have to wonder how you feel about this, because I find it kind of horrifying. No, it's terrible, and it's, some, it's you know, listen, it's something that people were joking about. You know, we were making jokes back when we did Alive about, because Frank Marshall and Kathleen Kennedy, they were all, they were very up on, you know, the, all the things, all the developments that were happening in Lucasfilms. And we used to joke about, you know, one day you, they won't be have to cast actors anymore. You know, you'll just be <laughs> CGI'd in. And especially some of these people like Will Smith, you know, they've all been all digitized. Right. And, they, you know, and you figure, well, I don't even want to have to pay a Will Smith. I'll just use his clone. So... That becomes the interesting thing in terms of Screen Actors Guild. If it's a film and somebody is just voicing someone, I wonder who gets paid the SAG rate. I thinking. What is the, you know, you would who makes the contract for this? What is this considered? Doesn't this break the rules of, of Screen Actors Guild? What if he is nominated for an Oscar? 
I don't think that's going to happen because <laughs> I think it's going to not be very good. But I guess the biggest question is why, when there is such a plethora of actors and actors who love James Dean, that why use a kind of a novelty of putting James Dean in the movie? And another thing I'm thinking of, you know, maybe James Dean would not want to be in a movie about the Vietnam uh, War. Or CGI'd, you know? Maybe he didn't want this to happen. When you think about his kind of energy as an actor and someone who was one of the first to really kind of introduce new techniques into the craft. and Right. After studio acting. Absolutely. This doesn't feel like the kind of move he would support. No. And I just, I don't understand. And the article said that the producers of the film said, you know, we looked high and low and we just couldn't find anyone for the role. Yeah, that's, I know, that's that's just not true. It's uh, like, come on, use your imagination. I know, be Stanley Kubrick. He didn't, he, you know, he would see hundreds and hundreds of people. Absolutely. Before someone. Now, two things about this. One, I recall that a number of years ago, Fred Astaire's uh, widow sued a manufacturer, a vacuum cleaner manufacturer, for using an altered image of Fred Astaire in their vacuum cleaner commercial. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what happened to that about using their image. And then I'm also recalling our conversation with Bella Lugosi Jr., and he was responsible also, remember, he said, for a law in which you couldn't just use someone's likeness. Yep. So again, I don't know... Who in the family, James Dean Dynasty, you know, that they got to kind of authorize this. But yet it's yet another thing that we as actors have to worry about. Um, one th- Along the same lines is this idea that now on television shows, you know, you can't even see the credits. It, mm-hmm. You know, it just goes to the next show as if the people who made it are meaningless. Right. And again, it seems to be it's not so much about, uh, you know, making sure you see the next episode. But there's a little bit of minimizing the creative people who make the product, I think. Absolutely. I mean, I just, at first I thought they were doing a James Dean biopic and they were using CGI to recreate James Dean. And I would have had problems with that, yeah. but it didn't feel as bad. But once I figured out that they cast James Dean to play another part, it just doesn't even make sense to me. No, you know? it's going to have an, uh, you know, an all like any clone. I, 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 it's not going. Obviously, it's not going to live and breathe and react off of another actor. And then you're asking the other actor to react off what a tennis ball or something like well, that. Yeah, and it's like you think in film schools when people study the filmography of James Dean, do they include this film because James Dean was cast in it? Or it's a that's it's, a good point. It's no. kind of upsetting. You can. I think no. it's very upsetting. Yeah. I, I mean, it goes along the lines. I haven't I haven't read uh, Marty's Mr. Scorsese's uh, op-ed about his the Marvel controversy and all of that. So um, I have to see. I mean, I know you know. Obviously, he loves cinema, and uh, so I look forward to reading it. But right now, I I don't really have much to say except for. You know, I, pro- I probably will agree with you, but I haven't. <laughs> but I haven't. Right. Right. It's pretty, you know, he, it's it's all you know, it's all sort of interesting. Yes. Um, have you seen the show Black Mirror, Ileana, on Netflix? N- not only have I not seen it, yeah, I, I, it's no, it's not my cup of tea. I, there was the funny somebody did a funny tweet about stop making television shows <laughs> because again, there's so many shows, so many. I, I have friends in shows, and and you have to watch them. And my friend has a term he calls it sampling, <laughs> where he just watches enough to get a feel. But I watch the entire show even if I hate it. Right. So you, what is that? It sucks you in. I, I reason- just because I keep I, there's the it keeps threatening. Threatening to get better. I know. And it doesn't. And then when it doesn't. I the wish I could nice mention thing, some of the recent ones. I know. Keep, make, keep it anonymous. Keep it politically yeah. correct. But the thing about Black Mirror, the only reason I bring it up is because yeah. there it's a anthology show, kind of Twilight Zone-esque, about the horrible things that social media and sort of media-related technology are doing to us as people. Right. And they did an episode about the horrible future in which we might recreate the CGI likeness of deceased actors. And here we are. (laughs) So that show can be kind of prophetic. I had a feeling this was coming. You know, the interesting thing, and I I mentioned this uh, before, I think, uh, Marilyn Monroe 
is still the she's the number one most recognizable actress on the planet. Yep. She's been dead for all these years, but you know her her legacy and somebody like Marilyn Monroe and James Dean, they're they're you know they're idols, people, right. and they kind of lived and died a certain image and have been portrayed in songs and you know so but no i think it's a terrible thing and who knows you know maybe maybe they'll decide now not to do it now that they've had this sort of public uh you know public shaming but i don't know the the everything seems like a carnival atmosphere <laughs> lately <laughs> of of just so that's you know as we go into our movie season i i'm very old fashioned i like to just go to see the movies and Oh, I have a complaint. I'm like getting like a grumpy old person. Uh, my final thing before we bring Daniel Waters. Has anyone else experienced going to the Arclight? It's very messy. The Hollywood? The Hollywood Arclight. Come on, guys. Pull it together. Uh-oh. Yeah, I was very, very disturbed. I went to, I did the uh, interview for Be Natural. You know, our friend oh, yeah. Pam Green, the documentary. And the movie before us was a Terminator movie. The floor was filthy. Oof. It was covered with popcorn. There were soda, you know, things there. Nobody cleaned it up. The staff was kidding around with each other, talking. It was really shocking. And that's the second time that that's happened. So Arclight in Hollywood, I'm attending there. And I almost said something. I almost, you know, sort of said something about it. And I it mentioned it to a couple of cinephile friends and they said, yeah, the arc light's going downhill. So that's not good. Don't go downhill. We love the arc light. We do. So and on that note. We also love Daniel Waters. Let's bring him in We here. love Daniel Waters. Let's talk about Daniel. Uh, he got his start in high school. He was writing a column called Troubled Waters for the high school newspaper. And that was what sort of gave him some of the ideas for Heathers, for which he received uh, the Edgar Award. And over the next years, he served as a co-writer on the comedy The Adventures of Ford Fairlane, uh, scripted Batman Returns, wrote the film Hudson Hawk, and Demolition Man. <laughs> and... Uh, Current movies include Happy Campers, Sex and Death 101, Vampire Academy, and I've and uh, in addition to that, you're a movie lover as as I am. Have you uh, welcome Daniel Waters? Thank you, and boy, you didn't have to read them all. <laughs> can we can we edit those parentheses? <laughs> uh, thanks so much for being here. Now you're here. Uh, and we've met it all. It's so funny. We've never actually had a conversation, even though our mutual friend uh, Josh Olson has been on the show. Adam Rifkin has been on the show. Oh, yes. I think that maybe Michael Tolkien. Uh, Michael. We've had Michael on the show. We have a lot of writers because I love writers, and I, I always feel like they they don't get enough. They don't get the quite the glory that the well, yes, absolutely that the director you know that the director gets. Um, but it's the 25th anniversary of Heather's. It's the 30th, 30th anniversary. anniversary. Thank you for making oh. it seem like it was I, not that long ago. I know. I was trying I'll, to help I'll, I'll take every year. <laughs> I was trying to help myself out. Yeah. And I, you know, I can take the blame on that one as a producer. I do believe I told her 25. You said 25. Yes. I just good. I, I like 10 would be a nice number. <laughs> oh, my God. Because you know, I don't have to tell people I wrote it when I was 11, you know. The, and so what is it? So, and you've been, is there um are they releasing it? Is it Criterion? Is it who's it's, putting it's, it out? It's it's um, a steel box Blu-ray release, and it's got a new new interview with me and Michael Lehman. It's got a whole sorts of bells and whistles. I don't even know what a steel box is, but I was told to say that. Okay, steel book, steel book, which I guess is a good thing. Oh. It, it commentary? I love commentary. Well, they had, the, here's the thing. They have uh, my they have my old commentary okay. from when I was the the babe who just wrote it. Oh, okay. Well, and that can be good. Yeah, which is fresh, fresh, and fun. But I think you know, I, maybe we'll hold out for the 50th anniversary in a couple of years, where um, <laughs> where I'll have my old wizened looking back on it, like, oh, who is my first screenplay? Who knew I was peaking? <laughs> um, now that you're go. Going around, is there is there one question that you just get like I can't get asked that about one more time about Heather's or? 
Well, I mean, I, I, believe me, anytime you're talking about Heather's and not some of the other movies you mentioned, um, I'm, I'm happy. Oh, okay. So, so but, but people always are kind of un- weird because the, the dialogue of the film is, you know, very distinctive. Some would say overwritten. Um, but um, people are always say, well, how did you write this line? How did you write that line? And I'm like... That's so funny. Yeah. I, I like, sat oh, down okay. and... Yeah, well, I mean... I guess it's my writing process that I don't. I do like to come up with good lines, but I like to do them before I actually start writing. Like I don't. I I hate movies about writing, especially screenwriting, where there there's a blank computer. They got the words fade in, and the writer's just behind, mm, frowning and furrowing, and like and then all of a sudden a storm happens, and then all of a sudden <laughs> like they're like Liberace, and they just go crazy and start typing this unique thing. I like to do. I'll do anything to not do the writing. Like you know. Yeah. Yeah. Nine months of pregnancy, I call it, and then where I just collect little things, collect little notes, little insights, yeah. little, you know, I come up with some of that dialogue way before I actually sit down to write it. So when I do sit down to write it, I've got all these sales receipts and candy wrapper napkins and like, mm-hmm. oh, hey, this is going to be a bad day after all. Look, look at my myself from three weeks ago came up with this. This is great. And do you print up for, for I need to print. I can't. What may seem brilliant on the computer, the minute I print it up and read it and have a pencil, it suddenly is seems repetitive or horrible. Oh yeah, well I I again as much as I take my time writing, I take even more time putting on a computer. I write everything by hand. Wow. And, okay. And you know to to, to the frame of how old Heather is, it was it was written by hand on notebooks. Then then I wrote it out neatly, and then I typed it on a typewriter. Oh my God! And the first draft only. The se- by the time the second draft, we got computers and yeah. everything, moving cars, and it was great. But uh, yeah, I'll do any because I agree that once it goes on the computer, it's got to be good. Look how good it looks. You know, <laughs> it, this has got to be great. You know, it's fantastic. <laughs> but yeah, and so I, I do I do do a lot of printing up and like okay, it was as bad as I remembered. Um. So and so I, these are some of the. F- famous things associated with the film that you wanted the screenplay to be directed by Stanley Kubrick. Is that true? That is unfortunately absolutely true. Although, you know, now it's like, I think even though he's dead now, I think think everyone should be aspirational. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like, what would Stanley say in this situation? Like, I think it was good. I mean, definitely it came from a great place as far as, like, let's face it, he had, you know, I'm here, here I am. I've never written anything before. If I write some, if I'm gonna go to the trouble writing something, it better right. be better be pretty good. And and I was kind of, it came from a place of like I was tired of teen, the certain kind of teen films. I was enjoying John Hughes movies, but boy, he's just gonna keep making them, isn't he? And <laughs> and it was like you know, I'd open up the newspaper. We had newspapers back then, and <laughs> and and I would say, well, why isn't the teen film I want to see playing in town? Right. And I realized, I guess I have to write it, and then let's see. Stanley Kubrick did a war film. He did a science fiction film. He did a horror film. I mean, he's got to be dying for his teen film now. Like you know, That's so funny. so I thought, just like give me the address and I'll mail it to him. And and, and did you did what were like what was it cover? Do you have the your cover letter to Kubrick? <laughs> I have a lot of my letters to people. I write these letters, and people, I go, what do you think? And they go, it's way too long, Ileana, get to the point. But oftentimes oh, yeah. people well, respond to a personal letter. Yeah, I, I'm big on personal letters. Um, yeah, most of my breakups are personal letters. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, but t- t- it was my first draft was over 200 pages, but I thought Stanley could get away with it. <laughs> yeah. But it, it, it reality seeped in. Kind of quickly, I had I I have very honest friends, and they they really liked the script, but right. they kind of brought me, and so and and then they had this friend that they all knew at USC, Michael Lehman, and I and I always joke with them, Kubrick to Lehman, quite a drop, but um, <laughs> but and he was calling me and giving me notes, and I'm like, oh, this is this guy, boy, me and Stanley gonna have a good laugh over this dude, <laughs> and you know, but eventually, he became my director, and I was very you know because here I am, I have these highfalutin aspirations but at the end of the day especially this movie every time i there's so many people have said such great things about heathers so when i end up at a screening i'm like oh this is going to be great i'm watching the godfather written by me and then (laughs) it's like oh it's a late 80s cult film that's very good and it's got some great satirica but you know it's also goofy as hell like you know and and i realize that's who i am i'm you know i'll undercut any pretentiousness 
with a goofy joke if, if if I can get a laugh. Like so. Yeah. So and Layman was very much the same way. Stanley would have probably taken all my all my stuff out, but the uh, so you never got any. You never could figure because he would. I guess he would fa- if he even wrote people back. He faxed them back. Didn't I th- he? I think yeah. The... Well, I, he was big on phone calls. Oh, he was. He, he loved calling Isn't people. Funny, on the certain phone. people. Yeah, Brando was that way. I, I think when you get older and kind of slightly like Wizard yeah. of Oz ish, yes. it's like he would keep you on the phone. I I ran into Todd Field, who directed in the bedroom and was an <laughs> actor, and and he, he sat down and talked to, with me and my brother about like meeting Stanley Kubrick. And Stanley Kubrick called him in the middle of the night and says, "God, I really loved you in Gross Anatomy," and like, and he's like. <laughs> Stanley Kubrick watched Gross Anatomy? Like, this is crazy. But but Winona Ryder did end up having a conversation with him about doing a project with him, and, mm-hmm. and she, you know, 15 years later did the spiel. Oh, okay. Of like, oh, you know, we had a movie in the hopper for you, buddy, and like, you blew it. And I don't, I think his reaction was very polite and... Yeah, somebody like that is so isolated. It would have been... Uh, there was no gross anatomy, I think. It would have been it. nice to. It rem- it reminds me of... Uh, remember the Teenage Mutant Turtles? Oh, yes. And and um, Martin Scorsese's then-agent, Mike Ovitz, said to Marty, now, why can't you make a movie like the Teenage <laughs> Mutant Ninja Turtles? And Marty said, if I made it, it would be the neurotic teenage <laughs> mutants. Well, yeah, up y- yes, I think I do have a lot of neurotic Ninja Turtle movies. I mean, I think <laughs> if you look at some of my action films in the 90s, I, d- I definitely... Yeah, they would, have a flair, I was flair. Yeah, I, they brought in a rhinoceros to be fixed, and I put a, rhino- a giraffe's head on top of it. So it was, it was definitely... Something that they didn't want, but right. they have cult followings, everybody. But I also think that that was the era in the '90s where you could uh, make movies, and they, they it wasn't like today where you know, as they say, the, they call it the cancel culture, where you do one thing wrong, and you know, I mean, people were experimenting. There were a number of studios where you knew the players, I think, and. Yes, it, the movie was considered maybe you know a bomb or it didn't go. But I, I think that in retrospect, I don't recall the Batman movies be, being in an uproar. It, 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 oh it, yeah, no, we were living in in Tim Burton and I were living in precious golden yeah. times of like we we were two guys sitting in a room like, hey, what would you do with this Batman guy? <laughs> now we would have a tribunal and we'd be exactly. hung, at, hung at dawn for breaking this rule and that yeah. rule. And but like, in those days, it was like, guys, lighten up. It was a television show. They filmed it in Runyon Canyon. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. For God's sakes. It's like it's where the bat... Wait, but, you, but you, you know, you would look at <laughs> anthology books about Batman and like, oh, and Batman in the, 60, in the 50s was like this. During the war, he was like this. And like, yeah, uh, he's supposed to go through some transformations and like suddenly it's like, no, you have to do it exactly like this. But. And what's interesting is that I guess probably that strain, if you went that far, a, a little bit of that element trickles then into every subsequent Batman movie, whether recognized or not, I would say. I, I would, would argue. Maybe it's the lighting or something. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, well, definitely, definitely, definitely more the lighting. I think the writing, unfortunately, has gotten a little more codified, like, you uh-huh. know, that... There's enough of none of this playing around stuff like, you know, (laughs) like, I mean, I, you know, there's been talk about Marvel movies and all that. And like, I think they're perfectly terrific and fine. And but but my thing is, like, it's the audience is watching the same thing, the same movie. I like what I like about Batman Returns is like it's a bit of a mess, but everyone's getting something different out of it. Like some people are laughing. Some people are not laughing. Some people are laughing at different scenes. Some people think michelle pfeiffer is quite creepy and disturbing and some people love her and some people think she's creepy and disturbing and love her and like that that everybody's got a different reaction to it so that that's what i i go for i would love to do things that don't get yeah i feel like the action movies now like we're going for this and we're getting it 
Yeah, I don't know. They kind of, they kind of go over my head. They they just seem very Under loud. Your head. Yes. Uh, you know, but yeah, very loud and and they're going by too fast. I, I don't like any movie that's too loud. First <laughs> of all, that's that's my critique. <laughs> <laughs> Of, don't make Eliana Douglas says too loud. <laughs> Turn it down. Put that on the poster. <laughs> um, why were you voted in high school most unforgettable? Is it? Yeah, I mean, like, let's just say you know, most likely to succeed and most unforgettable, two different things. Uh huh. <laughs> like you know, there could be a double. Who came up with that? That already ex- sounds mean. Oh, well, I was quite proud of it oh, at the time. Are. But, you know, I, there was a bit of a double-edged sword to it, I think. But, you know, I'll, I'll take it. That you were... You know, I'm, I'm, be, here, my brother, who's also a director, mm-hmm. he was voted most likely to succeed in his class. <laughs> really? And I was voted most unforgettable. And this is the way we like it. I mm-hmm. did Heathers. He did Mean Girls. Like, you know, yeah. that, that, like, he, I can be the ho- the weird haute couture guy, and he can be the ready-to-wear that pleases everyone guy. <laughs> like this, I, I like this separation. So, you know, most unforgettable, the bad and the good of it, I, I accept it. But, yeah, because I was the kind of a, I was not aloof a beavis. Or... I, <laughs> aloof. Oh, this guy's so aloof. He's unforgettable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean, um, you know. Well, and, I'm thinking I mean, of Christian Slater a little bit. He well, has an aloof sexiness in yeah, I th- film. Well, uh, it's I fun. can't understand why the girls don't, uh, I mean, uh, go, don't go for him. He's very handsome <laughs> compared to the doofy, you know. <laughs> well, it's, it's funny because if you knew the high school I went to, it, it's, it's not the pristine, rich um, school of Heathers or any right. other high school movie. It was kind of a Jonathan Demme kind of high school and Days and Confused kind of high school where everybody yeah. was kind of fun and got along. And But, um, yeah, but most of them forget, because I was, I was a comedian, I was the class clown, but I wasn't mm-hmm. the Beavis and Butthead class clown making right. fart noises. So I was, <laughs> you know, there's the, 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 my wit was appreciated. Oh, well, that's good. Mine was not. I was class clown, and I, I actually campaigned to not be. I begged people. I did not want to be class clown. I said, I'll be oh. anything else. <laughs> oh, yeah, but, the females class clowns get a rough go. Yeah, nobody, yeah, no girl just wants. just like, we don't think of you sexually at all. Yeah, we just, <laughs> we are the funny friends. Yes. You know, who, I, they, they would always, you know, the guys come to you and say they're in love with Peggy. Yes. <laughs> And you think it's going to be yeah, you. you. What do you tell a girl that you're in love with? Oh, really? Is this what? No, no, I'm talking about Peggy. <laughs> you think you think he's finally come around, and then it's like, <laughs> it, no, it's Laura this time. Well, most forgettable wasn't getting a lot of action either. Too much now, so. <laughs> um, I was fascinated by this, that you read uh, Seventeen magazine. Now, does that mean that you like, did you also see, because I know you're a film buff too, were you seeing movies like Go Ask Alice and Me, Natalie? and these... Me, Natalie? I don't know Me, Natalie. Oh, my, oh my God. Oh my that was gosh. such a major, it, it's Al Pacino's first uh, movie role. Oh, wow. I think... Patty Duke. Yeah. Patty oh, my Duke. gosh. I got to look that up. I oh, it's think so. I came of age on Bobby Deerfield years, but. It was, um. It was on school, you know, it was on, um, it would play on, on television. But we had a very weird school where I think part of our health department or sex education, they would show cut down versions of Hollywood films. Oh, wow. And to teach us some moral lesson, like 45 minute version of the Oxbow incident, for instance. Oh, jeez. Yeah, it was very odd. Yeah. I, I always remember, and I don't remember if it was social studies or, but I just remember part of the curriculum. And part of this curriculum was me, Natalie, because I think it, had, oh, I, and I was like, what is this movie again? And, and later on, I found out it was Al Pacino that was in this movie. Well, I certainly, Hit the ground running seeing movies, so I yeah. Uh, I, and go ask Alice was it, an go ask Alice. Drug. Yeah, that, that's funny. I can't. It it didn't have this. I mean, I know there was a TV movie, but it I feel like it hasn't had this seminal cinematic representation. Did you it, watch the after? And that was my sweet spot. The you know the afternoon movies, the portrait of a teenage oh, alcoholic. Yeah, well, I mean, those. part of Heather's came from those movies. Like, I mean. I feel like the whole culture is those movies now, but we used to have the actual movies back then and the after school specials. And, and kid, but like kids that. knew they were funny. Yeah, I mean, but that's the thing. I mean, the adults <laughs> didn't know they were funny, 
but but yeah. th- that's where Heather's came from. Was like, oh boy, these are the lessons we're being taught. Like, and so a lot of my yeah favorite lines of like, there's a line in Heather's where. Um, one of the teachers says whether to commit suicide or not is one of the most important decisions a teenager can make. I, and I, I love that's, that line. That's like, that's it's a classic today line, yes. but it's also a classic like after school special line. Like, <laughs> wait a second, we're, we're getting something a little wrong. Something's a little off about that line. I right, because my... in reality, I think what they really were were those kind of exploitation movies, like women's prison movies yeah, exactly. of the fifties. You know, the girls were. It, it always having sex or yeah, let's bring it to the cliff. Taking right drugs away. and you know it was always something horrible was you know was happening to them. Yeah, nobody watched Dawn Portrait of a Teenage Runaway to make sure she got back home. Like, <laughs> one, like okay, let's let's get her on the street. Okay, well, what's Dawn up to? <laughs> yeah, they were they were, at, but I loved all those. There was one one. Uh, did you ever see one called The People Next Door? Eli Wallach. Eli Wallach and Aunt Jack. I, I, yeah. I didn't know it was they one have, of those movies. Yes, they have a drug. Their daughter's tri- oh, yeah. tripping on acid. Oh, yeah. It, yes, it was. Go Ask Alice is one of my favorites. I mean, it, it's, sad. It, it's so exploitive. And, but she's having hallucinations. And I got, I would love to see that again. She ends up at a homeless shelter run by Andy Griffith. I'm sorry to laugh. I think they all ended like that. <laughs> and then he says to her, you want to end up like this guy? And then there's like another drug addict. You're supposed to be a you're supposed to be a clergy. Supposed to be a clergy. Yeah. And he goes and he, and he he tells her to call her. You know he's gonna call home and but he calls collect. I don't know. There's just some funny <laughs> things in it. So and then you read the second sex. Yeah. The, 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 Which I think is. But yeah, I think you're the only man I have ever met. Who has read the second sex? And, and that's funny because there's a line in the second sex where oh no, it's actually another Simone de Beauvoir book where she says, "No man has ever read Virginia Woolf's Room of Your Own." So it's like, I gotta get this book. <laughs> I gotta be that guy. I want to read this thing, man. Did, yeah, I mean, it's so funny when you bring up seven because I did read like I think my line back then was. I read Seventeen magazine and Se- Second Sex is science fiction. So a lot of the interviews I did around that time, I would, yeah. I would say that line. So I was living with Larry Karaszewski, who you know. Yes, and you love he Larry. would he would heard he would hear me on the other line doing an interview on the phone, and he would come up with a copy of Second Sex, and just, like point at it. So I, I feel like my <laughs> feminism was mocked. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and thus, Heather's was born, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, but the thing is. My feminism has always been more mercenary. Like, you know, mm. it's not helping the female race. It's more like, oh, my God, you make a female protagonist your lead. You're already on second base as far as originality. Mm. It just makes it that more interesting. It's going to give you an skewed point of view of everything. And, you know, God, I love these ladies. They're really <laughs> helping me out. They're helping my originality. Well, I think the idea, of, you know, the the idea that girls maintain their own oppression I thought was fat, you know, was which wow. Is, you dug deep. That was that was one of my cl- if I had a dollar for every time I said that line in the late eighties. <laughs> hey, uh, <laughs> I saw you across the room, and <laughs> I'm, you know, did you know that girls <laughs> maintain? That How's that it's, oppression maintaining going on? But this. everybody thought it was such a big deal when they did Mean Girls. But you, that was the same. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Material. You know? Yes, I, I when when my brother was directing and Tina Fey saw me on the set, she 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 pretended to cover her eyes, but like you know, but you know, like I say, I'm glad the money's somehow going back into the household. So. That's true. But yeah, um, so I want to talk a little bit about the casting, and uh, uh, one of the things I thought was very funny was that some <laughs> a lot of the teens who uh, you want in the movie, their one mother said that the script was the voice of evil i mean it's a i mean was it really that yeah that was heather graham's mother i had a feeling i wasn't i can't i <laughs> yeah, wouldn't yeah. Oh, i'll let sorry. you say it sorry. that's okay Gossipy. um yeah she was only 17 at the time when she tried out for the head heather and, and her name yeah. was heather yeah i bet I mean, she went did she want to be in the movie yeah no she tried she, but people she, regret and, and she, being she, in the she film. did a, she did a great great reading and yeah like, but you know, and then and like I'm gonna get you, mom. I'm gonna turn 18 and do boogie nights. Like you know, <laughs> geez, I'm sure their parents are like, oh, God, uh, we should have pled, pled out on Heather's. Yes, there. Yeah, I, I um, I there was a movie I was 
associated with many years ago, and there's a lot of moms around, and they're kind of they can be trouble. Yeah, I mean, I you know, of course, you know, I was a giggling. 25 year old when the movie was made so it was like oh somebody called me satan like it was just <laughs> fun which reminds me the first time i first day of shooting was ash wednesday and i'm still a good catholic boy and i came a lot of the cast hadn't met me yet and i came to the set with a huge <laughs> ash and and i had a priest who'd love to really lay it on thick so i had like a just a huge ash crucifix <laughs> and like i looked like manson like coming and and everybody was like oh course that's the writer oh that's so funny i love that um but winona Ryder has a, she comes from a hippie background yeah uh she's so terrific in the movie i mean just again these she leapt on this screen well yeah i mean she she really changed everything and like i mean even as you know like i came at it with such a from such an intellectual point of view of like, I, I made the movie through my head, like, oh, I, I'm going to make the Stanley Kubrick teen film. I'm going to have them speak in uh, elevated superior, mm. Shakespearean dialogue. I'm mm. going to, I'm going to have them. And then she came in and, and also the other actors, but mostly Winona, like she came in and just gave it such flesh and blood from the get go. And like suddenly it just, everything became different and it was a whole new movie. And I'm like watching it like, Hey, this is pretty good. This isn't just a cheap exercise in satire. This has got right. something going. And even stuff that was much darker in the script, like like the the first draft was like over 200 pages and she killed people and she was like practically Travis Bickle. And, and, and we started to bring that down a bit, but then we brought it down even more with Winona. So now she's completely like somebody you're completely invested in. And, and it re- you know, which, you know, and at the time I was like, you don't have to be invested in her. She's the little female. And, but it does make a difference. And when Winona really brought it to a different kind of life. Yeah, she was the antithesis of the John Hughes films, you know. Whereas in some, in the, I'm thinking of the John, of the Breakfast Club, you have people pretend with their dark makeup and pretending that they're. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's funny the, the John Hughes films, which I, you know, find adorable and they're enjoyable, but they, they they were like almost films for teenagers, like Disney films, almost like, oh, we're yeah. gonna have a good time watching this teen film. And oh, I like, would kill to, the high. I would think I used to think I would kill to be in high school like yeah, that with them. yeah. All mm-hmm. this, they're talking about their problems and and yeah, and the Breakfast Line has that famous Breakfast Club has that famous line of. When you grow up, your heart dies, and I'm like, "Well, wait a minute, it kind of dies when you're 12." But you know, <laughs> like, yeah. so it's it like the first you know, time they take your dog to the farm. Yeah, <laughs> yes, <laughs> but yeah, so it's like, you know, it's not like I want to do a documentary about high school, but even right. giving it 40 percent more reality, like, made a made a big difference. I mean, it, like, there's a compliment that was given to the film recently in the New Yorker, where it's like. It's the movie that turned the '80s into the '90s. That I mm. think it was the first. Yeah, it was even though it came in '89. It was the first '90s movie that it felt like you know. Yeah. Because everything after that, from Nirvana's video for t- mm-hmm. "Smells Like Teen Spirit" and everything, suddenly had that stank on it. <laughs> right. Or or a lot of these, all the high school movies became dark. Yeah. They, you know. Unfortunately, I think Heather's was a curse then everybody started speaking a little too nicely and elegant and 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 had were a little too witty and i've been i'm i'm longing for a movie like tex lately like matt Dillon and just <laughs> like what are you doing tonight i don't know what are you doing like you know i, I kind of like there's still part of teenage experiences like that 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 i think now, trust me i think now is everybody is it, it elevated it almost elevated the genre almost too much Right, the 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 all knowing uh, evil girl. Yeah. Who's but uh, yeah, but I, I mean, I but uh, you know, my you know, I I was not inspired as much by John Hughes movies as like T- Turner Classic Movie Channel movies. Where like, why do you want to hang out with people who don't have a great line coming up? Like you know, mm-hmm. like I, I like that. If I had five minutes to come up with a response, this is what I would come up with. <laughs> and only they're in live action. They're speaking just like that. That's uh, I love that. But the parents are always, and I was suddenly I'm just thinking of Ghost World too. In all these high school movies, the parents always have to be completely unaware <laughs> of what is happening. It just adds yeah. to the. But we're in your own life. Were your parents aware? 
I don't think my parents were aware of anything. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, my 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 concern was the, a lot of teen films made the parents villains. Like, if the mm-hmm. parents hadn't done this, I wouldn't have turned to drug addiction. If they hadn't done this, I'd be less mean. Like, and we, where Heather's and I think other movies after that came from point of view like, well, they're not really relevant, are they? Like, you know, <laughs> like yeah, that 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 you know, all this stuff is going on, and what they tell their parents is like just enough to like you know go by i think i think it's getting a little different now i think parents are way almost too involved now but <laughs> totally but 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 back back in that sweet spot it was kind of like they were just uh i mean even even the there's scenes in heathers where you know which which were straight from my father of like you know how was how was school today a uh, great pate like you know <laughs> where you just keep it on a certain level right like if if i if i told you five inches more i'd have to tell you five yards more and i can't do that um i want to ask about what, one of the things that stands out to me in the movie is the look of it and the clothes are so specific and was that something that was in the script or yeah this is something uh, um, uh, i'll drop jewels from time to time of writers but but when you're writing think of the halloween costume <laughs> like Ooh. like because Heather's the, Heather's is life's blood has come from the there's been a musical base uh, that yeah. helped get a new generations but but the 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 Halloween costume it's it's got a for three one for one and Catwoman's got a great costume like you know think of the costume because it, it, think of the what they're wearing because if the, if the movie's really going to be a success and a cold item for yeah. for for I can talk on a show about a thirty year anniversary DVD that. You got to have a good Halloween costume, but yes, the color coding was in the script, and like where the head Heather was red, and getting that red scrunchie was a big deal, and right uh, that. So I think, yeah, again, I think it goes back to not writing right away. Like I think if you just start typing, like a lot of that stuff uh, doesn't come to you. But if you spend all the time, what are they going to wear? Right. <laughs> like before you even start writing, then you have this stuff. Well, it was so. It, 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 I mean, look at the clothes. The clothes are fantastic in the movie. I think that's one of the reasons it holds up. Yeah, well, it's, it's funny because I, I think to look at. It. I loved it right off the bat. I think Michael Lehman wanted a little, and you know, he wanted a little more. Like, what are the kids wearing now? And I'm like, and then eventually we came around. Well, what if we're making the Conformist and not the Breakfast Club? <laughs> like, right. you know, let's 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 overdo the uniforms a bit, and then. Because every clique is dressed differently, and you, and you like, again, it goes back to Shakespeare. Is like the elite talk different, they dress different, you know, make it the elite. Mm-hmm. Uh, is it true that when Shannon Dougherty first saw the movie, she started to cry and ran out of the theater? Well, yes, with the with the with the line, nobody told me it was a comedy. <laughs> that is a true story, multi verified. I mean, that's uh, pretty good. Yeah, you gotta. It's, it's, I it's hope that's good. on the DVD release. And <laughs> has she since revised her? Uh, yeah, I, I think or? she's think she's like team she team satire. I I love satire. It's what I do. Like you know, I think because she's did it, She was in Heather's the TV series that they did briefly. Oh, okay. You know? But so she she's definitely in on the joke now. And, and I, by the way, I thought her Beverly Hills nine hundred two one zero reboot was the most hilarious thing. It was I thought it was brilliant. But that's another story. But yeah. That, that's true. Yeah, well, it's it's funny because I like what I like about Heather's and its reputation is that at least thirty percent don't get it, and like it, I think that makes it the other seventy percent coddle mm-hmm. it and love it all the more. Like people always come up to me and tell me great stories about like how they found their people in high school by just overhearing them quote Heather's and like wait you're Heather it's right it's, I call it secret handshake cinema but. <laughs> But my favorite story is like a couple came up to me and said they were going out with other people on a double date with each other, and their two, her boyfriend and his girlfriend started talking about how stupid and disgusting Heather's was, and then they just broke up with them and started going out the next day. I approve of that. So it's like that's that's what you want when you write a movie. You want to break up two couples. I I I, this as people know, I broke up with someone because they didn't like Harold and Maude. Back oh in, wow! The, this was back in I, I school. Usually, I give three. I give three. Really, what I was. Three? I spot two. Like, really, you know. 
And now, what would can you give us an example of a movie that there is... was somebody who said they don't like Albert Brooks? Yeah, Ooh. that's it. That's... And I know you'd be out the door by then. There's <laughs> no way. So, where'd she go? Where'd she go? Yeah, I'm like, I can't really give him Albert Brooks for that. Yeah, yeah, you uh, that would be a mo- and and you know, they'd have to sit. I mean, I, I'm trying to think how many times I've seen when Real Life came out, it was in one of the first movies that I remember being on cable. Yeah. And I think I watched it about a thousand times. Well, Charles Grodin's reaction to killing the that, horse. That's a great movie to watch a thousand times because there's always something different. I never got ti- I never got tired of seeing any of his movies. That's you're right. That's a deal breaker for me. Yeah. There's just certain she touchstones. Was re- she, she was really pretty, so I gave her two more. But <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> oh, you know, we, I, I forgot to ask you. We always ask people, do you remember the first movie you saw? Oh, my gosh. And I know that question was coming, and, and I just don't have a great... Well, maybe I, you I, think of it. That's yeah, all right. No, but uh, you don't think I thought about it? Like, I, I, I've, <laughs> I've been, like, going through mind therapy, uh, ayahuasca, and, like, this can't... But you used to make just... lists of... Did you make lists of your movies? Were you one of those type people? Oh, yeah. Like I, Peter I was Bogdanovich. big on this. I, I, for some reason, I always had to say who played the villain in every was it movie Dan Duryea, my favorite <laughs> Dan villain. Dan Duryea. That's my favorite villain. I have... He's I, my favorite. I have a line in a script I wrote where, like, Somebody calls somebody a Dan Duryea wannabe. Oh, that would be. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's sinking. If they're a wannabe of Dan yeah, Duryea, it's clearly to a white audience, as you can tell. <laughs> Only the Iliad of Douglas. I know yeah. these are the best. And we, then, we and are, then they have a fight over Robert Brooks. It's we are the like, deep yeah. cuts. You're my demo of one. That was uh, there was a director, uh, uh, Richard Glatzer. I walked up to him at a party and I said, you seem like a person who would know who Edgar Ulmer was. And he <laughs> laughed and he said, I do know who Edgar Ulmer was. That's Ol- a good opening we, line. And then we talked. Oh, there he is, Dan Duryea. <laughs> wow. Who's doing that? It's it, our, it's our it, phantom in the or, booth. Or do you always bring it's up Ryan. Dan Duryea? That's right. Hey, how you and, doing? Well, says, I bring you have him Dan up. Duryea on deck. I bring him. <laughs> <laughs> He's in our stock yeah, folder. Know. <laughs> I do remember sleeping in a station wagon. Catching some of Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid. Okay, but but that will qual- like that'll that, qualify uh, I you. Yes, Other- otherwise we'd have to stop the show immediately. Yeah. Now, yeah. did you are, do you do you like the term um, black comedy movie? I was in called to die for. They always called a black comedy. I don't think I think it's a satire. Black comedy can. The, I like, how well, do you feel I'm about that? I'm preferring dark comedy, but even even dark comedy is now like you know. I mean, it's funny. I used to work in a video store. Yes. When I, I wrote Heather's in a video store, and and it's like the what gets sold as a dark comedy or a black comedy is so, so it you it, it became in the video store business it meant didn't do well at the box office. Yes, so that's a cult <laughs> so, movie. So it's just like the term's been ruined. It's been yeah. stained. Like you know. Yeah, and the, I know there was a plethora of dark comedies in the nineties. Yes, that was the dark comedy era. Absolutely. Anti Reagan, maybe. Yeah, no. Th- that's why I thought I thought we would have much more, many more dark comedies for Trump, but. So when. Oh, I get. Well, yeah, no, no, keep going. It's I know. Dan Dury and Trump. <laughs> <laughs> um, when. Did you uh, pre screen it for audiences or did it just go out there? Like, did you get little scorecards? We, did you we, go to the we had one. T- it's funny because uh, Denise Denovi, the producer, and Michael Lehman, the director, were doing another movie. Right after Heather's, before Heather's came out, so I was the only one at the focus group in the test screening, and oh, it was poor it, bastard. It, it was great, and I had a, like a. It's funny. I had a chirpy, chirpy sweet woman who was taking me around and sat next to me and was on the clipboard, like, "Ooh, the, this is your first test screen. It's starting now. Aren't you excited?" After the movie was over, wouldn't even look at me. Oh no! Just like was just <laughs> shuddering, and. I ran into, cut to, 25 years ago, Memphis Film Festival, a woman, I'll, I'll protect her name, cause, but, she's, but she's come to, she now runs her own film festival in Oregon, mm-hmm. and big in the independent world, and she's like, you probably don't remember this, but I was working when I was very, when I was 21, I was working as this, and like, you know, and I did, you were the girl I, I killed, I didn't know, <laughs> like, and she says, I've seen it three times now, I love the movie. Which I the, another thing I like about Heather's is, is like people always say, well the first time I saw it, it it bothered me. First time it, I was unsettled. First time I couldn't take it. First yeah. time I hated it, and I'm like, but now I love it. 
Mm-hmm. And I'm like, who? I'm not used to that reaction for any movie. And I'm like, oh, well, that makes me feel like nobody comes up to Richard Curtis and says, <laughs> you know, the first time I saw Notting Hill, I was traumatized. <laughs> But but now that I've grown to see it a couple of times, I really dig it. Like it's interesting with in the dark comedy genre because the the movie that I was in, Ghost World, which has a kind of high school absolutely. theme, similar, and again it did well when it came out, but it's done so much. Oh better yeah, now. now it's an American. Now film. again, it's considered to be a classic. American so classic. and again, people say uh, they've seen and they got the Halloween costume thing. Oh, yeah. But people have said to I've seen I went to Steve Buscemi times. last year. <laughs> really? <laughs> oh, my God. No, it's got some great... Uh, and, um, and uh, of course, Brad Renfro is in it, too. He oh, worked yeah. with mm. uh, Brad. Sweet, uh, sweet actor. Uh, okay, so did were you concerned at all about the plot line of suicide? And are people... I mean, I think that one of the great things about the movie is that in this politically correct environment, you can still you can watch it and you can still laugh. It's not like, oh God, how dare they do that? Yeah, I mean, some like you people, get a pass. Some people get some people still do. Oh, how dare they? But um, there was a thing in the Hollywood Reporter of a millennial. I'm a millennial reviewing Heather's, and and he was aghast and like, don't we us generation would never like this? And then of course the comment section, which I now bookmark for my ego to read. <laughs> yeah was all defending from every age group. It's not an age, I don't think it's an age thing as much as an attitude thing. But yeah, definitely there's people, definitely when I was, I mean, I have to go, when you say, was I, did I have fear of offending people? Like, it goes back to another, another advice, Halloween costume, another piece of advice. When you write your first screenplay, naivete is your friend. Like, mm-hmm. if you think about, yeah. if, you th- if you think, if, if if my old self could go back to my 20-something self and say, tell them what I know, like, I would never have written Heathers. Like, I would have right. been too terrified. Like, I defend people. I know what would want to make it. Like, you know, you can't, you can't think like that. You got to think, like, you know, what haven't you seen? And because mm-hmm. once you're original, then when you become original and you have y- your original voices out there, that's when they'll hire you to do a superhero movie and and just become you sell out. Don't sell out until you've been asked to sell out. But. <laughs> I also want to ask about the casting of Christian Slater, and how did he get into the the film? Yeah, it was a typical casting process. I mean, he was definitely the one I think who got mo- got along most with um, Winona. They had the most chemistry. Um, I mean, it's funny to think about like we. We thought, oh, he really, really does like that Jack Nicholson guy, doesn't he? And, and, yeah. and so, did he do that in the audition? Because that was the one thing I remember, even when the movie came out. That was yeah, like, yeah. And I then mean, this actor who keeps. I doing mean, in Nicholson. Christian's defense, he stuck with it a long time. His voice <laughs> is pretty Jackie right now. I, I think to this day, but <laughs> he said he threw in a, you know what I mean, which, <laughs> which is such a Nicholson handle. If he hadn't done that. <laughs> that was the give. That was the, the well. The hilarious thing is, Michael, you know and, and this mean? is such a thing about editing too. Is like where you you're in the movie. You're always bring your writer in the editing room because that way they they can't tell tattletales. They can't tattletale against you because they're there with you. So we think we're we're going through Christian Slater's performance with a fine tooth jeweler's loop, making it less like Jack Nicholson, <laughs> and like oh this is great. Oh my God. Oh who he he went really Nicholson there. Let's bring. So great, and then by the time we finish editing, like no one's gonna know he loves Jack Nicholson. No, and then of course the movie comes on, like whoa, hello Jack Nicholson, and like, but we had thought we had done so much to make yeah. it less Jack Nicholson. Much like it's when fine. me and when me and Michael Amon edited Hudson Hawk, we thought we could have got all this crazy shit that didn't work, and like whoa, they're gonna think this movie was was <laughs> they're not gonna know how crazy batshit crazy this movie was and how it doesn't work. The uh... And and did he ever explain why he liked Jack Nicholson so much? Well, I think I think it was a new I mean, actor. I mean, if he was doing like playing, you know, he didn't ne- think it was obvious. Yeah, I mean, his next movie was he was a a, a mentally handicapped person who get who falls in love with Marissa Tomei as a waitress. I don't think he brought his Jack that Nicholson. That one I auditioned for. I didn't Untamed not, Heart. I did. Yeah, they well, didn't pick me. They well, went with Rosie Perez. Oh, jeez. I know they were wrong. <laughs> um. <laughs> Yeah, and he, I don't think I don't remember him pulling out the jack for that one. I think it was yeah. more that there is the 
you know, when you put a line like nag, nag, nag in the movie, like who who's not going to, Matthew Modine's going to do Jack Nicholson. Like, you know, it's just, it's, yeah. it brings that, the role brought out everybody's Jack. I think that, uh, well, I said this, I used to imitate R uh, Richard Dreyfus, but nobody knew <laughs> that I was because I was a girl and maybe I did it. But, you know, my friends Someone's did. seen the competition a lot. So, uh, w so when I was in school, my friends were like, she's doing Richard Dreyfus. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but I could do it because I'm a girl. I wouldn't do it That's funny. so much. But you just talk with a certain staccato and yeah. you're doing, you know. <laughs> and Nicholson was a go-to also for me. Walken at all? No, never him. Okay. Nicholson oh. always, because I loved, uh, you know, Randall P. McMurphy. Oh, yeah. Was, oh, yeah. I think, again, you know, going back to you, 17, there were certain books, The Bell Jar, and there were certain performances, and I think Jack Nicholson, you know, there's a progression when you're a teenager <laughs> in your teenage angst. And, yes. and I think that Jack Nicholson, Randall P. McMurphy was part of mine, so I can see why it would have been part of Christian Slater's. Yeah, and when you watch the movie today, you, you're it's a great actor. You, you're you're not no, it's you're, not. you're not giving it the white glove test like too much. Jack like Nicholson, you're like, hey, how much in a movie where somebody's doing Jack Nicholson? This is I'm having a good time. We need more of it. Yeah, where, yeah. Where, where were more people imitating great actors? I, oh, I think it works for him. Yeah. You know, and again, it's an, I think it's another thing that makes it uh, that makes it fun. OK, I do want to get to Virgo. You finally did meet John Hughes on the set of Ford Fairlane. Oh, Is that my true? Gosh, who told you that story? I do my research. OK, that it was such a weird. This doesn't this doesn't make us either of us look good. <laughs> um, it was the. Okay, I did this movie for I did I worked with let's put it a colorful character Joel Silver did three movies. Yes, did, I, he produced action that I was in. Oh, that's right, of course. He's the I said to him, "You understand I'm playing a prostitute and I'm not a prostitute." <laughs> okay, that was, that's that's a good lead in for Joel. Yeah. yeah so He's a nice guy. So yeah, so we, like of all the like we're trying to cut down another crazy script that I tried to cut down but he just made it crazier. But there was one scene where the character of Ford Fairlane <laughs> has to investigate a clue at a sorority. Like, and I go, well, we, we don't need the sorority scene. We, we, we need these scenes where he actually does, does some detective work. Like, forget that. We've got to have the sorority scene. So I go to the set of the sorority scene. I mean, it was a small set. This doesn't make any look good. <laughs> Remember Second Sex, Seventeen Magazine, Feminist. Here we go. Okay, so it's the nineties. It was a tight set. All these girls in negligee, too expensive for actual sorority girls. Right. And and in a cramped video village, like in a kitchen, is so many celebrities and famous writers and famous directors. You, you would blow your mind. And we're like, and and that's how I meet John Hughes. He's standing there sweating, and like we're all just. Just a bunch of sweaty perverts, and like you know. <laughs> and so he came by on that particular day. Yes, they used to always have. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, where were you during the the Capitol <laughs> Records fight sequence? Like, right, or um, the night shoot. Yes, it's yeah. always yeah. Oh, this was a night shoot. I'll give oh, them credit. Nice. And they were there all night. <laughs> um, yes, but but yeah. So we had a brief conversation, and then I ran into him in Tower Records, and mm -hmm. and he, I was and and we remember we, what he was buying at we, all. We, I think, I don't know if I was buying the Beach Boys box set or if he yeah. was, but I feel like we talked about the Beach Boys. Oh, cool. And and then but he he talked about how much he liked Danny Aiello and For Hudson Hawk, which... Oh, that's good. Like, geez, okay, that's getting pretty obscure. But, um, but uh, like, apparently he told Michael Amon he loved Heathers, which uh, I never got that approbation. So. Oh, well, that's good. Yeah. Because uh, I, 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 I think a lot of people who did articles on Heathers at the time said... Boy, this really puts John Hughes in his place. Makes John Hughes look like the turd he is. Like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Nobody does it have to be against John Hughes? Well, critics always like to yeah, yeah, definitely. do that. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about um, some of your favorite high school movies. Oh, I, I, I was not thinking you were going to get to it, but I'm prepared, and I'm going to give you ones that you don't get every day. Ooh. I want to. I would love to hear some of your favorite high school movies. Okay. If you've listed I'll, I'm gonna, them. I'm going to rattle them off. Okay. Like Let's a Gatlin see. gun. Um, 
(laughs) Lord Love a Duck. Have you seen that one? George Axelrod. George Axelrod, writer, director of Manchurian Candidate. Come on. Um, Roddy oh, not, no, he was the writer director of Lord Love and Talk. He was just the writer man. He was he was out of his mind during yeah. the making of yes. that. Ronnie McDowell was kind of like the nerd J D. Like yeah. the intellectual J D. I love so, this movie. And yeah, Tuesday Weld. Tuesday Weld, of course, amazing. Lo- who? A cashmere oh. sweater sequence. That's one for the ages. But And the and the um the conversation pit, right? Isn't that the one? Oh yeah. <laughs> Ruth, isn't Ruth Gordon in it? Oh yeah, you know, and yeah, there is now I want to see it again. Okay, yes, Lord Love yeah, a Duck. Lord Love a Duck written but, and directed but, but like, by Axel Rudd. God, it's a real strain of dark comedy and like there's <laughs> yes. a there's a fake they fake her mother's suicide, so there's there's a little there's a little something in there. Little something in the stew. I love that. Did you have any any more? Or? I got some more. I feel like yeah. that was the one that was going to impress you, though. It did impress me. Um, I know. Now it's a little downhill because um, I didn't go old school. Okay, I'm going to go old school. Oh, you Here's, go old school. Uh, we'll, we'll compare. I'm a big um, Rumblefish person, though. Oh, I, mm. yeah, Rumblefish. I, that, I didn't put that one on the list. Up the Down Staircase. Do you remember that? Sandy Dennis. Sandy Dennis, I was going to say. Is a teacher... In in um, Sandy Dennis was never a teenager for me. Oh, she's the teacher. She's the teacher, and one of her students gets involved with an older teacher. He's kind of a Lothario, and kind of get and there at one point there's a, she takes an this interest. Is, this is this is so up my alley. I don't know she, why I haven't seen it. Oh I, my God, you'd love it. There's a there's a American Jean, Private Miss Jean Brody. I, there's I a know. Spanish kid who she kind of takes. She wants him to do better. And then he mistakes this for that she, you know, wants something. And Jeez. It's very Sandy dark. Dennis doesn't send out those signals usually. <laughs> it, it's an amazing film. Oh, uh, wow. Really, really I, good. I, Up the Down Staircase. Okay, that's a great one. No, um, oh, my God. I've got a couple. I got, I got, go I got one that hasn't even come out yet. What? It's going to play at the AFI Festival next week. Okay. But... but but um, it's called Sela and the Spades. Sela hmm. and the Spades, okay. And it is, de- you know, definitely um, multiracial. Like I can't remember the director's name, but she's she's she she's going to be a household name. But it's kind of like I, I it's saying too much to call it a, a, a Heather's update because it, it it does place an elite school with an elite female clique. But it's more like The Godfather it, in high school. It is incredible, and it deals with clicks and things, and mm. and of course heightened dialogue and all that. But it looks gorgeous, and and it was like it really took my fancy. It, it, if it needs a scepter for me to okay. bestow something on it, I will bestow something on it. And there's another crazy movie. Let me get it in, called Detention. Not a lot of people have seen it. Haven't seen that one. It's, it's this actor Josh Hutchinson who was in Hunger Games. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But this movie is nuts. It's directed by a crazy director named Joseph Kahn, who did that movie, um, mm. that crazy rap movie last year. I can't check spacing on the title. But this movie is every teen film smashed together. It's got, it's got the clicks. It's got, but it's got science fiction time travel. It's got a body switch mother fa- mother daughter body switch movie, all crammed into it. It's pretty crazy. Oh, that looks fun, Jeff. Do you have. A I couple? feel like mine are more earnest. I hope that's okay. No, I want to hear some. Hey, don't say Angus. I won't say Angus, no. I do love Juno. I love Diablo Cody as a writer. So I feel like that was an important movie for me to really kind of develop taste and a good script. Um, and Got to get past that first scene, though. Yeah. It takes some acclamation. It's, is it too stylistic for you? It, that yeah, first scene? It, it was too. And then it's just okay. I can't. I'm not gonna take this. I'm like, and then you get into it, and it's, I'm it sure softens. people. I'm sure people have the same reaction to Heather's too. Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's that really, really assured writer's voice. That even if you come in swinging and you take that risk, I'm on board. Mm-hmm. Yes. Just a lot of times with a movie like that. And then I also there's a movie that speaking of Albert Brooks he produced it a couple years ago called The Edge of Seventeen. I don't know if you guys got to catch oh, yeah. that movie. Uh, Haley Steinfeld did a really good performance. Young up and coming female writer director named Kelly Fremont Craig directed that movie. I loved it. I thought yes. it was a really just kind of gentle, earnest retelling of you know the high school experience. Yeah, I saw that movie. She I had a, that was speaking good. of costumes, she had a great jacket in that movie. She did <laughs> that, that, that winter that winter jacket yeah, she that did. where you just want the girl to take it. Will you take the jacket off? You look <laughs> ridiculous. And the, but I had so many friends in high school would always have that jacket on. That's what we need. Yeah, you needed the jacket. Yeah. To, to shoplift. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, maybe I'm maybe I've said too much. Okay, I like uh, uh, in the, you know rock and roll high school. 
Oh, of course, Alan Arkish. Our, our buddy man. Alan. That's a super fun movie. Oh, absolutely. That I, I, is a high school. I movie. tried to. I tried to. I tried to. Be it's silly, but yeah, no, it's it's hilarious. It's awesome. Um, if for serious films, I, I I'm going with Election. It's mm. one of my oh, all time brilliant. Uh, 1999. What a year for movies. Yeah, yeah. Alexander Payne just. I, I I that bring the pain in terms right. of the teacher. I love the the student teacher. That again, where where the students re, the teachers were really portrayed as hating the kids. Yes, and, and it really seemed very truthful. Oh. I'm Matthew surprised Broderick. you build that as a serious movie. When I think of election, I think of it as I guess it's, it's serious. Kind of tragic. I mean, it is a tragedy. It's yeah, a tragedy, but it's. Uh, I just think it's an incredible well, it, looking film. Yeah, yeah it, going it, back to your thing. The, it, it, draw, it draws blood, which mm-hmm. you know, to me yeah. it can be a comedy or a drama, but I, I, I like it. I love it. And I do love Rushmore. Mm. I don't know if it's exactly a high school movie, but I, I, I loved his performance as a high school student. Oh, yeah. Know, That's great. Doing staging Apocalypse Now and stuff. I th- thought that was... Yeah, I, like, I mean, I it, it, like Wes Anderson kind of turns everything into Wes Anderson movies. So even if it was a war film, it would you would bring it up as like my favorite war films. It yeah. Like, oh, Wes. <laughs> He's his own genre. Yeah. Um, and another one I'm going to mention, just I, I cannot see it. There's I, Every time it's on, I'm a sucker. The Blackboard Jungle. I love that mm. movie. Oh, you I, black. Yes. That's I, I love Glenn Ford. And all the high school students are in their mid thirties. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's uh, Mark's Paul Mazursky's first on-screen performance. Oh, wow. A young Paul Mazursky, and Christine Poitier, amazing. But there's elements of it that are really, really disturbing. Oh yeah, one great. of them where they beat up the music teacher and they break his glasses. <laughs> now I just thought that it's, you know they really show. The teenagers, which was in the fifties, is delinquents. You know <laughs> where the where the teachers and that and that all carries through to up the down staircase, and that was the sixties. You know where a teacher now it's it, it's the reverse. Now the teachers are all jerks, but in those movies, well, there was a there was, a, a great nasty cult film that I always thought was an update of um, Blackboard Jungle, the class of nineteen eighty four. Oh, I don't. I don't know. Oh, that one. It's, it's okay. Good. It's, it's brutal. It's but but the the, the the believe me. It's it's the, Michael J. Fox is the one good student in it, and the uh-huh. rest are rest are just angry punks. And, oh, okay. And, but but they end up killing some teenagers. So it, I mean, killing up killing some teenagers. So it takes away the fun a little bit. But it but it was it has the blackboard jungle template <laughs> only. Let's get crazy. Yeah. yeah. I, I like that. Um, and the last one I'm going to mention, which is kind of a ripoff of Heather's, it's called Thoroughbreds. Oh. Have you heard of Thoroughbreds? Yeah, no, I fall my, it, it's in the top t- top 10 percentile of my Heather's re- ripoffs. Like, you know, <laughs> like I, I, you know I, I'm admired to be in the same room. But like, Thoroughbreds is a movie that I really think is, is very, very good. Didn't really get talked about from... I want to say 2017. I'm not quite sure about that. Was, but, that's about right. But uh, three, you know, high school students, and they from Connecticut, and uh, they're going to kill their rich, wealthy stepfather. But again, it has that same vein. It oh, and me of, then yeah, and the dialogue is still crazy, and yeah, it's got to to make. Hopefully, this will make people watch the whole thing. A classic last line. Ooh, okay. Already cool. I love it. Well, well you can't be my age, and I know this is a family connection for you, but if you're specifically my my age, Mean Girls is just such a cult classic. All right, so you're, yes. I'm assuming Heather's couldn't be on any of these Heather's is my number two, I will say. Okay, I just thought well, it might that, be redundant fine. to oh, mention Oh, Heather's is, of course, is a uh, given. Okay, but I'm, I, that's that's all good. That's good. Because, yeah. because I... Because I said I, Thoroughbreds because, is a ripoff. Because yes. I would agree that that one of my... I would, since Thanksgiving's coming up, I, 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 I would give a tie to Heather's and Mean Girls because they are two, t- you know, I like to make fun that he ripped me off, but it, they, it's a totally different movie, and it's Completely. so... It's so funny. It's one of the, I mean, it doesn't get credit as not only being one of the funniest teen films ever made. It's one of the per capita, and it's not just my brother. It's you know Tina Fey obviously, right. but 
but more of the per capita laughs than any movie I've seen, and it it still keep it still plays so well. It's also just that thing where I think specifically for my age, you know, people who are probably ten years older than me, Heather's would be their version of that. You know, it's just when you see kind of a subversive teen comedy, and Heather's is a little more subversive than Mean Girls. I think Mean Girls kind of plays the middle a little more. But it is such a sharply written joke machine, that film. Yeah. I mean, that's what Tina Fey does, you know? So I do... That's a big one for me, definitely. No, I... I yeah, it's, it's, it's always hard to hear, but, you know, it's, <laughs> but, but it's a great movie. Yeah, That's definitely. funny. They, they, that I, I mean, what are the chances that both you and your brother would make? I, well, you know, our, our our sister, who our little sister, who's a lawyer, she mm-hmm. she she's got a lot. She was she was a, she was a, she was the Veronica. She was the girl. She was the Lindsay Lohan. She had. A, although I joke that everyone who comes up to me and says they were Veronica were really a Heather. But, <laughs> but oh, that's funny. But she she they, we sister provided some good tales for us. Heather's has a re, you know there's redemption at the end. Yeah. It does have a happy ending. Yeah, sort of. Kind of. You know, she's going to be friends with the girl yeah. that's been... I, I've written so many endings for Heather. The, the actual ending is just one of them in my mind. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to be said on the record, if you look at my list, hard copy, Heather's is number two right there. So. This is true. We've got validation. Yes. Yes. And it's on the record, just so you know, Dan. I yes. want you to know that. Oh, thank you. Two very important movies for me, both of them. So, Well, you know, we, we try. Yes. Awesome. Yes. All righty. Well... Uh, thank you so much, Daniel, for, oh, geez. for Th- thank doing you. this. Thank God we didn't get my other films. This is good. <laughs> well, I thought I really wanted well, to do a deep dive on yeah, Heather's absolutely. just because that's the one that's going to come out. And, uh, exactly. You can, come, we, you can come back and we can do a deep dive on Hudson Hawk. I'd love oh, to see all geez, the stuff that got dive. cut. Yeah, well, there's a, well, that was the last... there's a whole subplot of a dead mo- murdered monkey that was cut. So Ooh. that's all I'll leave you with. You know, oh, give, you, give you a little taste. So now we have to bring you back so we can hear <laughs> about the murdered monkey, I think. I mean, Dan, Ileana said it. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Our audience loves having writers on here, and it just yeah. really is so valuable to have you in studio. And I can tell you, as someone who does love a dark comedy, Heather's is such personally an important film for me. So thank you for writing it. No and Mean th- Girls, but we get it. So thank you. <laughs> and guys, of course, this is the film scene with Ileana Douglas. You can tune in every Thursday live on the Popcorn Talk Network at 2 p.m. Pacific, or check out our podcast if you could please subscribe to both this channel and the podcast that would be wonderful yes we're taking next week off because Ileana is traveling and I think... I'm traveling and yes. again if you're in Tucson Arizona the Law of Cinema Sunday 2 o'clock Allison Anders and I will be screening Grace of My Heart and there'll be a QA and a and a book signing afterwards and as we end the show as I always say everyone's life is like a movie with a beginning, a middle, and an end. And this is the end of our show for today. Thank you so much, Daniel Waters. And go get your copy of Heather's. Bye. Thanks for tuning into the film scene with Ileana Douglas, airing exclusively on the Popcorn Talk Network. We bring you this show for free because we're just as passionate and borderline obsessed with film as you are. And it would mean a lot if you would please subscribe to our podcast and give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. It takes five minutes to review the show, but it helps other film junkies find the show and continue to spread a love of classic and contemporary film. For guest inquiries or live bookings, you can email me, Jeff Graham, at guests at afterbuzztv.com. That's G u e s t s at a f t e r b u z z dot com. For more incredible film content, check us out online at the Popcorn Talk, and we'll see you after the credits. Our founder Kevin Undergaro and me, Maria Menunos, would like to thank you for tuning in to After Buzz TV. Remember, we're not just the first; we're the biggest in the world, and we're the only destination for all your favorite TV shows. Whatever you crave, we've got it. So go to afterbuzztv.com and check out our lineup. Buzz you later. Mm-hmm. <laughs>